the city of brotherly girls. So I'm here with John DeSanto. He's a Atlantic City Boxing Hall of Famer, the founder of phillyboxinghistory.com, the prominent source of all Philadelphia boxing, uh, founder of the Briscoe Awards, the Philadelphia Boxing uh, Grave Program, uh, author of two books now. We got both here. Uh, it's John DeSanto we're going to talk today. How's everything been, John? How you been? Good, good. Thanks for having me on, Danny. I, pre I really appreciate you coming on. It's a uh, you're a huge icon in Philadelphia, as we all know. It's free to come on to do the second episode. It's, it means a lot to me, and I appreciate mm. it. Cool. Yeah, very good. Yeah, well, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so let's talk about the book a little bit. I know the first one you co-authored with Matt Ward. Um, yeah. Well, let's talk about the new one, because it's it's just, it's Pennsylvania Box Hall of Fame, so it's more you know centered toward Philadelphia. Yeah. So let's talk about this. <clears throat> what motivated you to, write a, to do a second one by yourself with the PA Box Hall of Fame book? Well, um, Matt and I did the Atlantic City book and um, it went well. Like we we got along great, collaborated um, really well on it. Um, and after that was out and we were selling it, I started thinking about, you know, what the next thing would be. And um, I thought about doing one on the Pennsylvania Boxing Hall of Fame because at the moment I'm the the chairman of the Hall of Fame. Um, I've been the chairman about 12 years, been working with the Hall of Fame, maybe pushing 20 years, like maybe 18 years, something like that. And um, I thought while I'm the chairman, I thought it would be a great thing to do um, to uh, create like a, a book, a, a written record and put something out there. So leave something behind. Like, you know, I won't be chairman forever. And um, I wanted to uh, do some kind of project. And like when I got involved with the Hall of Fame, um, it was even tough to know exactly who was in at the moment because they kind of stopped keeping the list. And so myself and a couple other people helped me. Um, we, we um, dug out the old programs and uh, newspaper clippings and tried to put together the list and to see, see, you know, who, who was in everybody that was in. And um, so that was the thing. There was a, like over the last, you know, several years, um, like I've kept the records and, and it's been, you know, everything's been um, recorded, but there's, is, there isn't a lot of information about like how it got started. There's a few newspaper articles about how it started the hall of fame and back in 1958, but all the, all the steps and all the other things involved, um, there wasn't anything really recorded. So I thought, well, it'd be a good project to do. And when, when I'm gone as the chairman, it'll be, um, you know, just something that's there and maybe something that someone else will take up and, and do another one, you know, years from now. But um, I also wanted like the introduction of the, of the book talks about how the hall of fame was put together and some of the challenges of um, that I ran into um, working there and, and, you know, kind of um, bringing it, bringing it um, up to date, so to speak. And, yeah, so I wanted I wanted to put it on the record. So so that that was the main thing. And I called Matt and said, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about doing another book and I want to do it myself because I'm the chairman. So I wanted it my voice and I wanted it to, um, you know, be, you know, my record of, of you know, how things have gone and, and what it's about. So I think it's, was, it's perfect how like with the website, the thing that I loved about the website when I was in college and I was looking through it and I called you. It's a in-depth record of guys like, say, Gus Razio or guys mm -hmm. like uh, Joe Grimm, guys that you normally wouldn't find anything about. And <clears throat> somehow you compiled them all onto the same website. And then this from here is almost like if someone were to get into, you know, I'm, I show this book to someone, it's almost an introduction to the website, too. Yeah, I can see that. Um, and yeah, I'm, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And it was one of my goals with the website. Um, more so with the website than than the book but um you know guys like joe frazier bernard hopkins people like that their legacies are set you know they, they don't they don't need a lot of help but some of the people you mentioned you know they're 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 forgotten in, in, a, in a lot of cases you know hardcore fans know who they are but um you know to the average you know new boxing fan or even even a um 
even a you know like a like a, a seasoned boxing fan you know the, these guys are are kind of lost to history they they had great careers they maybe they would become world champions or they weren't on tv and things like that so you know part of the idea especially with the website was to you know just just um you know get their stories out there you keep them alive in a sense and that's what that's what um probably the the primary goal of of the website was with the hall of fame you know it's one of those things um these books the arcadia publishing books they are um they're a template you know they are a a certain style if i came to them and said hey i want this one to be 800 pages they'd say hit the road it's not the case you know you have a certain amount of space to do it so the pennsylvania boxing hall of fame as of last year's class which was the 65th year um, there are 438 total inductees over those 65 years. The book of this size allowed me to get about half of them in there, photos and descriptions and you know, profiles of them. Um, and so what I did was I reserved four pages to do a list, a complete list of all 438. Um, so that was that was a big challenge. Is, and, and same with the Atlantic City book. You know, the, the Atlantic City history is, you know, this big. And you got to narrow it down and, and make it fit into that. So it is highlights. So in a way it's a great starting point, you know, maybe a really hardcore, hardcore boxing fan who, who knows all the names and all the things. The book I think is still probably good for them entertaining, but it's especially good as an overview, like a starting point. You look and say, Hey, here's a, at a, at a glance, here's what the hall of fame is all about. And it's, um, you know, it, 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 it covers a lot. It, it lists everyone, but it covers quite a few of the, the standouts. And, if, you know, there's a lot of big names that aren't in here. As I said, some of them don't need too much help. But so I might have bumped someone like, you know, like Michael Spinks is in the in the um, Pennsylvania Boxing Hall of Fame. Great fighter. But, you know, to, to put him in here half a page, I'd rather put someone that's lesser known. Yeah, since I'm since I'm, I'm competing for space, so and not to single out Michael Spinks. There's a lot. Of, there's there's you know 200 people that aren't in the book, you know. So yeah, he's not alone. Now, what's the process of getting? Like I'm looking at it here, and you have if I can show it to the camera, it's these old, almost like these old promos, and like what's the process of getting these old photos and like the light, like to licensing rights, and like walk through kind of that process of obtaining the information and then being able to put it all together in a book like the process of it yeah i mean that that's really the tricky part um especially the first time we did it with the atlantic city book i was extremely concerned because the atlantic city history includes people like mike tyson arturo gatti evander holyfield these are not so long ago and they're big names and so the photographs are um spoken for they're they're you know they're um there's copyright. Most photos are copyrighted. Um, if you're going way, way, way back, um, they might be um, not not the case. So the key is that we have to clear everything. And um, basically, my starting point was that I have a really big archive of photos. I've been collecting photos and memorabilia for a long time now. So um, the first book, we signed the contract and you know got started and probably a couple of months after that happened covid lockdown happened so it was a great project to work on you know i'm trapped in my house and luckily i had a you know big archive of things so it was tricky because i couldn't get to libraries and i couldn't go meet with other collectors to you know find photos um but had a lot to work with so i had a lot of photos that um i technically own but doesn't mean I have copyright for. So the key is, is to find the photographers and to try to clear as many as you can easily. And that means I relied on people like Daryl Cobb, who's a, you know, great photographer. He's not, he's a, he's a current guy yeah. and, you know, got a lot of pictures from him, Ray Bailey, who's a bit older. He's been around a bit longer, um, older than Daryl. I mean, and he, you know, has been shooting boxing for 30 years. So, um, I relied on them. And then there's some others, Jano Cohen, my, I, I took some pictures, you, you know, use some of my pictures, but I also bought years ago, I bought a collection of photos. There was a local, um, photographer, um, a guy who lived in New Jersey, South Jersey, uh, his name was Pete Goldfield. And he was, he was, a you know, he, he photographed boxing for a long time. He did, you know, 
Um, he covered the fights and he also did a lot of great like publicity shots. And that was his particular strength. His publicity pose shots were, you know, phenomenal. And he died many years ago. And, you know, a few years after he died, I, I stumbled onto someone who had not his entire collection of photos, but um, a big chunk. I bought photos that was probably, you know, tens of thousands of images, probably 50, I don't even know how many, 50, 60, 70,000 images and negatives and slides and prints, all kinds of things. So that was a great starting point because he was particularly active in the 1980s. And so that was the boom time in Atlantic City. So I used a lot of his photos of which I had um, clearance for because I, I own the negatives. Um, and, um, you know, hooked up with other photographers, as I said, um, a guy named Bill Barron, who was friends with um, Pete Goldfield, who was a young guy, like, you know, he's a, you know, um, in his 20s back in the, the heyday of Atlantic City and was going to going to fights and taking pictures. So that was the, the key was doing that. Now we had to buy a few images or like, lease a few images from like say temple university or different collections like that and then where we couldn't fill in like i was i had certain pictures of mike tyson that i had clearance for um but you know some of the biggest fights there were mike tyson fights and i didn't have photos from all of those key fights and so i could swap in things like memorabilia like a poster or a ticket stub or something like that and in the end, it really helps the book because it gives it a variety of images. It's not all just an action shot or a pose shot. You know, it's a variety of images. So in some cases, we'd find um, maybe I'd have some photos and say, you know what, we should sub it for, here's a cool image of a, you know, you know, an old postcard or something like that. And so that's part of it too. It's just making it visually interesting to flip through the book and see all these different types of images. So with the Hall of Pennsylvania Hall of Fame, it was the same. The second book it was the same. Same process. Tap my tap my archive, use um, everything I could get get clearance for what I could, and then took a couple of risks. I have a bunch of photos that I don't know who the who the photographers were, so I sort of credited them in you know in in uh, you know in aggregate in the in the acknowledgments, but like I couldn't find certain things. But it, it, it's minimal of that yeah. in the book and. Um, try to use as many um, ones as I could that, you know, like I said, the, the best thing is, like you know, getting clearance from the photographer itself and people who are friends of mine who, you know, like pulling all our stuff together, we can kind of patch it together. So that 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 was basically it. And um, the first time I was really nervous about it. And then I got I, I realized it was doable. And then the second time, second time felt a little easier because um, yeah. once I've been through it and second I was dealing with a lot of local photos and so local, local, you know, subject matter. So I could, um, I had a little bit more um, access that way. Now, how long did, did the whole process take? <laughs> Remember the Atlantic city one was a little bit longer, right? Cause it was the first time. Well, when you sign, when you like with this publisher, you sign the contract and then you have 18 months to get it done. So, yeah. So basically it takes about that long, you know, it's like, you know, when it started with Blank City, it was like, you know, you have only so much space. So we just said, OK, let's put together the list of Matt and I. Let's put together a list of everything we'd like to put in there, knowing that it was too long. And so, you know, um, you know, we probably had double, triple the amount of material. And then and then each of those like a list of like fight important fights or or um, like venues or, you know, different things. Atlantic City is a little bit different. Um, we have different things like the the passing of the casino, you know, like like the legalization of casino gambling. So like that's something that would have to be in there. So we have a whole list of things and then we start writing about it. And each of these entries in the book, again, it's a template, so it, you can only have so many words. So we'd overwrite those too. And then got all this stuff, had a big, you know, tons of material. Now we had to do the hard part and that was really cutting it down and saying, oh boy, I'd love to have this this fight in there or this in the case of the hall of fame, this boxer in there or this trainer, but we got to cut them. And that's, you know, like that's, it's really hard. Sometimes it would be, you know, it's a more complete um, 
like you know it's a like let's say in atlantic city michael spinks had um i don't remember the number of fights but he had a number of really important fights there but i wouldn't necessarily put eight entries for michael spinks so it's like trying to do like key ones like when he had a unification fight with kawi um that would be in there um but like i might be a, a solo um picture of michael spinks and then be able to um, cover some of his other title defenses and things like that. So there was always trying to find, you know, ways of including more people with the hall of fame. If I was writing about this trainer, um, and I have a picture of him, but then I found a picture of him standing with one of his fighters. Who's also in the hall of fame. That was the photo to use because then I could include them both and just, you know, compress them into one entry. So, you know, it was, it was the whole, the whole, thing it was a great exercise a great project both of them to work on but the real challenge was the editing of it and that meant that you know you want to you want to include more and like atlantic city there's more not in the book than is in the book but you know the highlights are there and the the the, the most important things are in the book um like i said with the hall of fame it's about half half of the inductees are um in there everyone's listed but you know it, it says that you know there could be another volume of it and get the other half um i'm not ready to jump on that but uh, <laughs> you know it is uh it is something to be done so yeah that that's it it was it was it was i when i write when i write when i'm writing about boxing or whatever and just in general i tend to overwrite you know write long and i mean that's my style but um that doesn't work for a book like this so it really helped me develop those muscles to kind of say, okay, I got to make some cuts and you have to make a lot of cuts and not only the number of well, the, the material you're covering, but then each individual subject, you got to shrink it down and make it fit. So, you know, it, it makes you a better writer and it makes, um, you know, for this type of book, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's a thumbnail of, of what's going on really. So. And it's a must read for any Philly boxing fan, like for any age, anyone who's involved with the sport, and you're also it's also the mecca of boxing. Philadelphia is the number one city for boxing. Really, it's a it's I a, think so. It is. It's and this is this is like a complete must read. And it can be for someone who's super well knowledge and well versed in it. It could also be someone who's maybe it's an introductory piece. And now all of a sudden they're just thinking, who's James Schuler or who's uh Joe Grimm who would run to the side of the church or any of these guys are the stuff I learned off right. of. So it's definitely Yeah, I mean I think I think that's I think that's true. I think for a really some a really knowledgeable boxing fan who especially like, you know, there's there's people, a lot of people um are into boxing and they're into the current fight scene. So that's that's a certain type of fan. Then there's people who are really um sort of um involved in the history of it. They know the history. So for someone like that, you know, they might read this book and for them, it might be a, a fun flip through and like, you know, memory lane kind of thing and saying, oh, you know, this is really good. It's a it's a it's a one source where you can go in and, you know, find all your favorite fighters and, and get the highlights of their career. Um, so it works for them. But it really would work for someone who's, you know, doesn't know a lot about the history or maybe it's just getting into boxing. It's a great introduction, too. So, yeah, I think it works for both ways. And I like these books. I have a, I have most of I probably all the boxing ones that have come out. They have them from you know all over people all over the country doing box, books like this. And then they're also they do ones for like different towns and all kinds of local topics. Like I I'm a, I'm a movie fan, so like I have one that's uh, and I live in South Jersey, South Jersey movie theaters. Like that's a really cool one because it's like oh yeah the movie theaters that are now like a you know either this one's torn down in my you know my in my immediate area or you know, this other place that used to be a, a movie theater is now like a set of stores. It's like a shopping area. You know, it's kind of cool to see the old pictures and, and that. So that's what these books do. And, um, you know, they really serve a serve an audience and, you know, they're, they're pretty cool. So, yeah, I was I was uh, I always liked them. And there was a one maybe 20 plus years ago um, that was done by Chuck Hassan and um Tracy Callis and Mike DeLisa about Philadelphia boxing, um, right then, Philadelphia boxing heritage. And, you know, I got that. I was crazy about it. You know, I loved it. That was around the time, like I had already started doing my website back then, or it was around the same time that I discovered that book. And it was, you know, it was awesome. It was really cool. Like, you know, had the whole swing of like, it was, I think it was um, 
1876 to 1976 or something like that. So that was great. I mean, that was really cool. So, yeah, so I like these books. Um, I've done two. I think future ones I'll probably do a different format, one where I can write a little more freely. But, um, yeah, these were great. These were great topics. And, you know, people seem to like them. So, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, happy to do it. I even bought a couple copies of Janot just to give them out. I thought it was so good. I thought it was yeah, awesome. great. What's the so it, it's almost as if like you feel a duty. Like I noticed just from talking to you for all these past couple of years, it's almost as if like you feel a duty to get the stories out of these guys, like to get the story of these warriors that maybe have been forgotten. You know, like what's the motivation? Like maybe as a kid, did you grow up a huge boxing fan, and did you see? maybe a disservice to the fighters where these stories aren't getting out or what was like the, what's like the driving force of you starting the website now becoming a published author and just kind of taking over, taking over that space. Well, I was a boxing fan from, you know, I was a young teen um, when I started liking boxing and, you know, I was just excited by, um, you know, I grew up in the, you know, born in the sixties, grew up in the seventies. And at that time, you know, Muhammad Ali was around, Roberto Duran. It's a great time. And so I could turn on my TV on a Saturday afternoon or a Monday night for a Muhammad Ali, you know, title defense. And I could get all these great fighters and, you know, watch these fights. So it was easy to become a fan. Um, now, I, I started, um, I got into boxing in an odd way, like it was always around. Like I remember when Ali and Frazier fought the first time I was, I was a kid and I wasn't so into the fight. I wasn't into boxing yet, but my brothers were, my older brothers were, and one of them was rooting for Frazier and one was rooting for Ali. And it was, so I got the sense of like what that was and, you know, staying up to hear who had won that kind of thing. So I was, you know, but I wasn't a hardcore yet. Um, so I was only, I, I, you know, I've been a boxing fan for most of my life. And, you know, watched every fight and, you know, just always like I started when I got my first VCR, I started to record fights on TV and, and you know, collecting what I could collect. If I go to a fight, I buy programs and, you know, whatever I could get, save my tickets and things like that. I was just really into it. I mean, I do that with a lot of things, but, you know, boxing was definitely the thing. But it really started when I around the time I turned 40. I started to become really sentimental about the fights that I started that when I started becoming a boxing fan, I used to go to the spectrum. My brother would take me to the spectrum long before I was driving and um, I would go with him and I'd watch these fights. And it was a great, it was a great era. It was the last, well, it was the, it was the, to me, the last great, great era was the 1980s. I mean, like the super era with, Leonard and Hearns and Duran and Hagler and those guys. But like the, the seventies were leading into that and it was still really rich time. And even for a local fight scene, I would go to the spectrum and I, I was lucky enough to be coming up with at the time, Jeff Chandler, Matthew Saad Muhammad right there. That's, that's can make you a boxing fan, but other guys, Curtis Parker. And I love Jerome Artis and all these guys. So I would go to see these fights and I just really, you know, I moved on in a sense that, you know, I lived through the Atlantic City boom and like I was in college at that time. I went to a bunch of those fights, but not nearly enough. Like now I think about it. I mean, I could just go home and, you know, I'd go down to the um, to the casinos the week of the fight to watch the guys train. They'd open like little like training camps before the fight. And then I'd watch them on TV because everything was on television. But, you know, I would go down there and watch fights occasionally. Um, and so I was always a fan. But when I hit Around 40, I got really sentimental about these fights that started me as a fan. And so I started thinking about what kind of project. I want to do some kind of project. I thought, you know, maybe I would write a book about the Spectrum era or um, my, my, my um, reflex would always be, oh, I'll make a documentary film about it. But at the time I was working, um, like my, 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 my working life, corporate life was at that time I was like a in marketing, like director of marketing of a company. And we were making, you know, websites for our products and things like that. And I wasn't creating websites, but I was like in the planning part and figuring out what the content should be. And at that time, like, you know, websites were, I mean, our websites were already pretty big, but it was like, that seemed like a really good way to go. 
And so what I thought was, what I liked about it was, like if I wrote a book, you write a book and that's it. You close it and you move on from it. If you make a film, which making a film is a heartbreak waiting to happen because it's expensive and difficult to, you know, talk about clearing footage and things, you know, it's a tough thing. But when you finish it, it's finished, which is a good thing, but that's it. And then you move on to maybe another, a website can be like this organic thing that never ends. And that really fit my style or my, my mentality because it meant that I could research old fighters, write things about them, find pictures, create graphics, do things like that, where I could go to a fight on Friday night, take my own pictures, come back, write about the fights, put them up that night. And a week later, do it all over again. And like, so it became this thing where I could start to just build this um, archive or this like um, uh, just a collection of, of um, images and, and words, stories. And in a sense, like I'd always focus on, you know, this weekend's fight, but what I was doing was just adding another, another element, adding it, adding it. And, you know, before long, I had thousands and thousands and thousands of pages and stories and what it was was a um you know it was a it was a it was a a history you know from my own perspective it was a history of all these fighters and what what always interested me um to get to your question to finally to answer your question um was like earlier on i said it like guys like joe frazier and um giardello and bernard hopkins they're in the international hall of fame they're they're legends they're always there and i love those guys but I was really taken by some of the lesser known guys and even guys like say Kitten Hayward or Tyrone Everett, Gypsy Joe Harris. These were not, you know, um, unknown fighters. They were stars in their day, but today, you know, people forget about them. So there was something that, that drove me to, um, you know, like, like whatever it is, you like movies and you sell, you say to someone, here's the movie you got to see. Like his, you know, oh, I saw this great movie. Or if you like music, you know, you have certain, or here's a new album that you want to tell someone about. Um, so it was the same thing with boxing. Like to me, I always said, like, I would get so excited for fights. And I'd think, oh man, the big fight is on Friday night on HBO. And, you know, I'm all excited. And I go, oh, one week to go, three days to go. And I realize nobody else around me <laughs> really cares that much yeah. and it's like like i'm in college and it's like you know i always say like you go to a cocktail party or something or go to a party i'm the only boxing fan there unless i'm at like a hall of fame or so, like i'm in the boxing group um that that's one of the things too like i like doing this stuff you know introduced me to a lot of people that had similar you know feelings about it but for a long time i just wanted to um share it like you know i was interested in this stuff and i wanted to share it with people and when i was a kid growing up um, you know, you could read plenty about Muhammad Ali and Joe Lewis, but when it came time to find out about Benny Briscoe, there wasn't a lot out there. Um, and so I wanted to create something because then someone like me, who was coming up and wanted to learn about these Philadelphia fighters, there would at least be something out there other than maybe a piece of memorabilia, which is, you know, a great way to learn about, you know, the fights and the fighters. Um, you know, Russell Peltz always had a great website with all his memorabilia and you know things that you could you know possibly buy on his site and stuff like that if you if you if you google benny briscoe back you know 20 years ago that might be the only thing to come up with and so now it's different because you know i have a lot of there's a lot of material out there on my site that comes up in these searches and so that was always my goal was to um or part of my goal was to um remind people of all this great history that that happened and you know it really is amazing like what what went on in philly like you said it's the you know it is the boxing capital at the very least a boxing capital you know i think it's the best boxing city um but it's amazing like how long it goes back how far it goes back i mean and and how strong like the fighters were all the way through it's just such a rich story and you go way back, you go back a hundred years and it's like, wow, look at all these fights. And they had fights every, you know, you know, like, there, were, there were so many fight venues and they all had fights. You have, you know, two, three fights on the same night, you know, it was ridiculous. So, and yeah, then, it was so the, the fact that that's out there 
you know, I wanted to, um, you know, let people know that there's, there's this thing, you know, that they should, they should, uh, if they're interested, they should read about it. They definitely, so I mean, the, you're a, any boxing fan should read your book. That's how I got into it. I was like a, I would say a pretty casual fan just growing up watching boxing and as a little boy watching the Rocky movies and mm -hmm. casual. And I was just on online looking up things. I'm typing in on Google, Philly boxing history, like Philadelphia boxing history. And your website comes up. And now all of a sudden I'm reading about like Gus Durazio. I'm reading about all these guys. Now I'm buying memorabilia of all, all these old guys. And it's almost like you go down that rabbit hole. And I think that's I, it. Yeah. I think I suffer a little bit of what we both may have where you get into something and you just mm -hmm. dive head first. And I think, I think that's oh, it. yeah. Yeah, I'm the same way. Books. I'm the same way. Like I, I love boxing and movies and some other things too. But yeah, like it's just a it's a never ending thing. Like I used to think I used to look like in Ring magazine and they'd have a picture of an old ticket, Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling and their heads, the the severed, the cut out heads, heads. on there. Yeah. And I'd say, wow. Like, you know, you didn't have that, you know, when I, my day was, a, it was like a computerized Ticketron ticket, you know, it was cool for what it was, but it wasn't exciting to look at. And I used to, you know, look at those things and think, oh my God, like I imagine holding one of those things. And then eBay came around and I was a Andrew. early on eBay That's and Andrew. I started to see this stuff. It's like, wow. It's like, I would go to the mall sports card show yeah. and it'd be all baseball cards and stuff, which, you know, I like that, but it was like, It'd be one guy with like a couple boxing cards and maybe you'd have a program and I'd, oh, I'd buy whatever I could, but they, I didn't have much access. When eBay came around, it was like the whole world opened up and you see like for first it was like, wow, some of these tickets, these Joe Lewis tickets are out there. And, you know, at times things are out there. It's like, oh, it's out of my price range. But over time, you know, you find, you find ways to get them. And like, I just started to buy memorabilia and it, I went from like dreaming about, um having like a ticket like that to having you know boxes full of them you know like that that's what it it's yeah you go down the rabbit hole i'm um, same way with movies you know um i collect movie posters and um you know i used to search images of old movies and posters and say ah oh, look at that i'd like to get but I, I never really thought about collecting. but then it clicks and i just start collecting then it's like and with like boxing it would be like okay i like uh this fighter and so, oh, look, I have a, po I finally have a poster of, you know, this fighter. And then I think, well, wait, he had eight title defenses. So maybe I can get all eight of the posters. And you know, so it starts like that. And it's like, well, it's a sickness. It just keeps going. You know, yeah, you, you just keep digging in and you do as much as you can, like as much as you can afford and as much as you can. I used to have my memorabilia in my house. Like I used to have a, a bin, like a big uh, plastic bin with posters in it like those cardboard like uh, half sheet posters in like big top loaders and i got to the point where the box got really that the bin got kind of full and i pulled my chair back in my office and i could kind of couldn't get around it so then i started to you know it, it went on and on i find new places for them and and now i've got storage spaces like i got big storage spaces that i rent just to keep everything in and um yeah it's, it's crazy it's it's nuts yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way. I got, I actually got these. It's funny because I was just about to hang them up, but I'll show you. You kind of inspired me when you told me that you collected uh, the newspaper photos. So oh, I got, yeah. got this one. This is Billy Kahn. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Razio on eBay. And then I got that. I got this one hanging up. You can't really see it, but it's uh, it's the Razio right before he fought Joe Lewis and he's training. And he's oh, a yeah. Picture of Joe Lewis on the wall. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, the cool thing about photos is now, I mean, there's still great, you know, photographs being taken of fights. Yeah. And, you know, the truth is, is that although there's it's not as strong in the newspaper, rarely in newspapers, but like now it's online. So guys like Daryl Cobb will take great photos and um, they'll be on websites and you'll see them. And not everybody goes to the fight. You know, it's the same thousand people going to these local fights and there's, you know, a million other people that aren't. And um but like that's people's uh, that's the, people's memories are tied to those photos. So it's they're still really powerful. But now everything's digital. And of course, you can print out photos, but it's not like it was now. It's like, you know, photo to me is really a precious thing. You find these old photos and it's like, 
wow, like sometimes I'll find pictures of an old fighter and I'll say, you know what? That's probably the only picture they ever took of this guy. Cause he's like a, he's a, like a local guy and you know, he's in his pose and, uh, and you look at it and it's like, you know, it's such a great thing. And it's, it's a, it's an artifact. It's a, you can hold it. And that's not the way it is now. Now everything's digital. It's, it doesn't exist in, you know, physical form. And that's what I like. I like paper and cardboard, you know, I'm addicted to it. As the, even the, like the ring magazine kind of dying out. That was huge. At one yeah. Point. Like I start, I have probably a hundred ring magazines. Now I collect those. I got the Rocky one up there. So mm -hmm. I'm up that too. Check, check this out, John. So tell me if you know anything about this. This I got this on eBay. Mm. It's uh yeah, yeah. Called Haymaker Magazine. Yeah. With I, I've name. seen that. That's Durazio, right? Yeah. I've yeah, come yeah. across I don't have that, but I've come across it. Um and I'm not sure what Haymaker was. If it was a little it almost looks like a little program. Um, but I came across that um somewhere. Somebody had one and I um, they weren't selling it, but I, I've seen that. It's really cool because it's like a, you know, a, a draw, like a drawing of him. Yeah. It's a little, it's like a little booklet. Yeah. Tried finding, I tried researching it. It doesn't, it looks like maybe my guess is, is that they tried to do, because it says issue one. So maybe mm. they tried to do their own little magazine and it didn't pan out. That's, yeah. that could have been it. And I love stuff like that. Like, for example, yeah. with the Pennsylvania Boxing Hall of Fame, every year, you know, we do a program. And if you go to any event now, the program is the classic eight and a half by 11, glossy color. And that's nice. There's no, no question about it. Ours is, looks kind of rinky dink to some people, but it's because it's because like, I love that kind of thing. Like the old programs, they were nice programs and everything. But if you go back in like in the sixties and the seventies, some of these little club shows, they'd have these little, these little like, um, you know, it's little papers folded over, stapled maybe. And they're just so different because they're all, they're very kind of like, um, they're handmade almost. And yeah. they're really cool. And and like, so I use that, like the Hall of Fame has always done that digest. It's called digest, like that size. It's sort of a, a full sheet folded over, you know, several sheets to make a little booklet. And I like that. And I've kept that going. Um you know, it's also more economical to do that, but it's also like when they started doing the Hall of Fame, the first couple of years, it was a little bit bigger, but they got into that digest size and it was going for, you know, 60, 60 plus years. And um, I like it. I, I like it. Some people say, oh, you know, you should do a, a, a real program, like a big program or something. And, you know, maybe one day we will. But, you know, I'm kind of stuck in the past and kind of stuck in the traditional stuff. And so I like that. And that little that little like um, magazine. Yeah, maybe that is what it is. Like it was a um, they used to do a lot of things that look like little um, magazines that they would also double as programs because they would put like an insert with the fight card in it. So it would have some stories and then they would put like, you know, it'd be one page with like the, you know, like the scorecard you know, for the different fights. Um, but yeah, so th those are really cool. Those are really nice. You get, you find stuff like that and you really feel like you've, yeah, you've uncovered like a treasure, man. It's like, yeah, you don't see stuff like that around. The feeling mm -hmm. you get too, you're like, I, I have to get it. You're like, I don't care. Right, yeah. 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 I love the programs that you do with the Briscoe, with the ones with uh, Bernard Hopkins last year, because mm -hmm. they have all the, the photos are black and white, but it reminds you of, like you said, like that old school program that you'd get or you'd find on eBay and it's modern. And I'll even walk yeah. around. I was I like that it's paper too. So I got when I went to your Briscoe Awards, I got Spinks to sign it. I got Joel mm. Jack. I had you sign one. I had everyone sign it. So this way I have it as almost a memorabilia piece. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I'm gonna have it all on there. And that it's like almost like a memory of the event. You know what I mean? Of going and having who you met and who you talked to. You yeah, know? definitely. And like a lot of those programs um will have like the old ones they'll have a page and it'll say autographs with yeah. the idea that people go around and get people to sign uh whether it's a celebrity or whether it's just their friends you know the thing and it's exactly that you look back years later and say oh look all these oh that's right i met this i met this fighter you know yeah. back in you know when i was younger yeah yeah that's cool what's the what was like the motivation to do the briscoe awards and even to name it after benny briscoe so i know you kind of it's almost like you you got the history covered and now you're even honoring the up and coming fighters like comeback of the year or upset of the year. Like last year I went to James Martin for his upset. Like guys that are 
up and coming guys that are new that maybe wouldn't get the usual acknowledgement that they would, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a, a couple things. One, the concept was I would like to do an award, do an event um, to bring the, the boxing community together. Now we're all together at the fights or at the hall of fame banquet, but I wanted to do something that was, um, you know, the Hall of Fame's based in the past, you know, retired fighters, you know, it's, it's basically like an older, it's an old man's thing, you know, like you get, you get, it's, it's like a, the end, like the end of your career, like a lifetime kind of achievement thing. Um, so that's kind of covered. Um, and with the Briscoe Awards, I always wanted to do like an event to capture maybe to honor some of the old guys, but also to capture history as it was unfolding. So, you know, I can sit there and write a story about, um, hey, this guy had the best year in, you know, 2023. But some people read that, some people won't, and it, you know, might have an impact, but not much. But to be honest, you know, like people read it and they just dispose of it. Yeah, you know, it's just they they consume it and that's it. But if you have an event and you say, okay, this is honoring this fight year, and you say, this person was the fighter of the year. This fight of all the fights that happened in the city of Philadelphia, this was the best fight of the year. And here's the rookie of the year, and here's the amateur, and here's the knockout. What you're doing is basically recording history as it unfolds. It's history in the making. And if people are, are come out to an event and they see this young guy go up there and accept the rookie of the year, um, they'll remember it more. And they'll also be invested in that fighter to say, oh, he's the rookie of the year. Let's see how he does next year, like in the second year. That was the idea. Um, again, like the fighter, like the old time fighter that nobody knows. And I want to remind people of, you know, who they were um this was similar you know like uh these guys don't get the recognition um until they make it to the next level and how many fighters if there's a thousand fighters a handful make it to the next level and even a fraction of that might get a title shot let alone become a champion so like i love i love the fight scene i love the boxers and i really admire them um it's not something i would want to do personally but yet I'm really like just completely consumed with it. And so like I could do a couple different things, three things really at once. One, record the history by saying, here's a snapshot of the whole year. Here's all the best accomplishments. And then the second thing is to give them a moment to shine and a moment of recognition, uh, which I think is important, especially in a young career. Um, and then the third thing was, I wanted to name it after Benny Briscoe. It could be named after a lot of fighters, but I wanted to name it after Benny Briscoe for a couple of reasons. Number one, he to me is the ultimate Philadelphia fighter. Um, very blue collar. You know, he had a very long career and he was, um, he did a lot of things. Like he was obviously a big puncher, but you know, later in his career, he got smarter and he, he, he extended his career um, he, you know, he's a little bit more, you know, defensive and, you know, he wasn't just a, a, a brawler, although at heart, that's what he was. Like he was a, he was a killer. Um, but he's a guy who, you know, he was alive when, when I started the Briscoe Wars, cause I had to go see him and get his permission to do it. And a guy like Benny Briscoe, is such a vivid memory to guys my age and older who saw him and you know he was a really special guy and he was also extremely popular um in philadelphia and and you know throughout the world but like especially around here um but he's a guy he's a perfect example when we're all gone who's going to be talking about a guy like benny briscoe and to me that's criminal i mean he should always be remembered and he will be remembered but I think that the Briscoe Awards will help that, you know, um, there'll be, there's like the Briscoe statue for certain awards and then there's the medal 
but both of them have his likeness. Um, and the idea that we got together every year to, to um, celebrate, you know, uh, Jerron Ennis or, or Stephen Fulton or Julian Williams, but yet we did it in the name of Benny Briscoe. Some people come to that because they like those fighters. And they say, well, who's Benny Briscoe? Well, that's a big room. This is the big reminder. So maybe maybe it doesn't register to everyone. But the point is, is that Benny Briscoe is, you know, we're, we're all here. You know, he, you know, these fighters um, are, you know, stood on the shoulders of, of Benny Briscoe or whatever, whatever the phrase is. You know, um, yeah. he was he's a forefather of this. Now, you can go way back and there's guys who, you know, Tommy Lochran, you know, go back, you know, many years before Briscoe or people like that. You know, you could name it after anyone, but I think if you if if when I close my eyes and think of what a Philadelphia fighter is, I think of Benny Briscoe. And so my award, my guy, so that's that's what's gonna be. I grew up, you know, I just came like I saw the tail end of his career. Um, and I vividly remember the Hagler fight, especially. And um, you know, he was an old guy by then, but he gave the great Marvin Hagler, he gave him, you know, a good fight. And you could tell Hagler was being really careful with him because he wasn't anyone to mess with, even as an old guy. But like I grew up with, you know, Chandler and Mike Rossman and Saad Muhammad and Curtis Parker. Um, those are the guys that you're my, you know, I could easily have named it after them. But Benny was the guy, he was the one, and he also, like I said, I wanted to do something to keep his name alive. And the other thing was this was always going to be a statue of, of him or like a likeness and who is cooler looking or who would <laughs> lend themselves to us, to a, a award, like a statue like that, than Benny Briscoe. He's one of the original guys with a bald head, you yeah. know, early on he had hair, but like, you know, he was one of the early guys to shave his head and he was just this blunt force, you know, guy and cool looking, mean looking it's, it's apparently a very sweet guy he's always nice There's a couple of few times that i met him i would talk to him on the phone a lot um he was a nice guy but like in the ring he was he was he was dangerous and that's the thing his image would lend itself really well to us to a, a trophy a statue and the name the name is really cool benny briscoe you know you can't beat it and so the idea of doing a benny a, a briscoe award it all fell together like the chandler award you know, it means a lot, but it doesn't have the same uh, the same ring to it. So, yeah. So that was it. That was the that was the thing. It was it was something I always want. Like when I started the website, it wasn't long before I said this is something I want to do. And it took a couple of years to get there, and um, you know, be in the position to do it, and then figure out what to do. Um, like I had to. I I started to reach out to Benny Briscoe to kind of. Benny was famously shy. He didn't go to fights after he retired he didn't show up at things and he didn't give a lot of interviews you know after his career and so I knew he was out there and so I wanted to become friendly with him because I had this idea I wanted to pitch to him plus I was tracking down all the all the great old fighters so I started to send him stuff in the mail like when his birthday I would send him like <laughs> I knew that he liked music a lot so I would send I like movies so I would send him movies about music like i remember when the the movie ray about ray charles was out i sent that to him once for his birthday and he get it and i get a phone call oh thanks for that and we talk and like so i became sort of friendly with him and i can send him a birthday card or something things like that just to kind of like get in his space you know without going and knocking on his door and then finally when the time came that i wanted to start doing this i went and talked to russell peltz um um great promoter and who was very instrumental in, in Benny's career. He was his promoter for a long period. And I went to him and pitched the idea to him and he, and he loved it. And I said, but I got to get to him. You know, that's not an easy thing. Yeah. I was just like, Benny comes out. It's, it's, it's like the groundhog, you know, once in a while, you know, he comes out and um, you know, if I called him up and said, um, I would talk to his wife and say, if I had said, Oh, I want to come interview him. She'd say, hit the road. Because she, every time I would talk, she would say, "Now you don't want to, you don't want to come interview. Like I don't want to do any stories or anything. No, no, no. I just want to, I just want to meet him. So you know, uh, Russell said to me, "I'll help you. You know, he could, he had a relationship with him. I'll help you uh, get to him." And so that's what we did. One Saturday afternoon, we went over there, and I pitched the idea to Benny, and he loved the idea, and he said, "Yeah, let's do it." And so then I went and talked to his wife, and you know, 
and we talked about the whole what I wanted to do and what the limitations were and you know you know what their concerns were and then they agreed and that got it started and then I got the artist to do the um to do the statue and uh yeah then it was off it was off and running but um yeah so it was it's a it's a cool thing because like it there's not a fighter that deserves it more than him um I mean it's a small thing it's a local thing um it's gotten bigger and bigger but the truth is is that it's like like anything it's it's really kind of like a cult you know he's a he's a cult figure he'll probably never get into the international boxing hall of fame which you know, i don't agree with but yeah you know, he's just one of those guys you know he he fought for the title three times but never uh won it and you know he had a lot of big wins but you know that's it he just he was a great fighter but not in the very top level yeah. so that you know he could be he could probably beat half the people in the hall of fame but the thing is is that he won't probably get there. So I, I wanted to do something that would, you know, just keep his name going. Now he's, he's passed away now. He's been gone for quite a while, but at the beginning um, he was involved in it. He, he was, he approved it. He, you know, Benny still was shy. He wouldn't, he didn't come to the Briscoe Wars. He was too cool for the Briscoe Wars. He didn't <laughs> come, but he, but the, the, you know, if I had it the next day, I'd call him up and say, here's what happened. And he'd say, who, you know, who was there? And, and I would send him the program and the posters and stuff like that. And he was really into it and he, he liked it. And, um, you know, we got a, I forget how many years, but maybe, you know, three or four years before he passed away. But, um, so yeah, he was part of it. And then his family beyond that was, you know, really into it too. They would come out to it, but yeah. So. That's awesome. And now we'll talk a little bit about, um, so I, I it made me think about it, the Giardello statue mm. down in South Philly, all these yeah. old statues you've been doing the grave program it's it's crazy all the stuff that you've done for the sport well it's all about the same thing and that is um like you, you talk about the rabbit hole and getting you know really yeah. drawn into things well that's that's kind of how i operate you know most things i'm interested in it's like i, I tend to take it a little far and yeah. each of those things uh, was just something that made total sense like the Greystone program, I was in the library looking at old microfilms of newspapers, which I did all the time. And I went over to, um, I wanted, I was researching Tyrone Everett and I was, you know, I remember when he fought, I never saw him fight live, but I especially remember when he fought um, Alfredo Escalera, a, a guy in my school had gone. So wow. the next day he was telling me about it. I was like so jealous. Like, oh my God, you were there. And uh, it was a famous controversial, you know, decision and everything. But I was researching him. You know, he died at 24. He was shot and killed. And so I was reading about his death and about the funeral. And it was such a crazy story about how many people came out to this funeral. He was really popular, um, especially in South Philly. And they talked about how the church where the viewing was, the line was wrapped around the block and the police were there. They had to control it because there were so many people. And they talked about how, you know, Tyron Everett was shot and killed and he was shot in the head, but he, um, he was a really handsome guy. And like, you know, uh, you know, he was a real kind of dashing figure back in the day. And um, he, the casket was up there and it was closed. But Mike Everett, his brother, who also fought for a world title, he's a, he's a, Mike's a great guy, um, he insisted that they open the casket because he wanted people to see that he still looked good. Apparently, if you read the, um, the reports of the death, he was shot and the bullet entered like in his nostril. So it didn't destroy his face. And so here was, you know, Mike said, people have to see this so he's like you know he's like arguing with the with the i guess the undertakers and they finally <laughs> opened the casket and it was just this crazy scene of like the emotion about like how how intense this this funeral was so i'm reading about that i'm thinking oh man like um i gotta go out and see his grave just as a you know i'm a catholic you know it's like kind of what it's your sort of you grow in you know it's part of the there's you know. yeah. <laughs> yeah so i like so i found out where he was buried and I went out to see the grave, pay my respects or whatever, take a picture of it to put on the website, you know, part of his, you know, the Tyron Everett, you know, page. But um, I couldn't find him. And so I, I went 
and I, I saw like a groundskeeper and I said, hey, you know, Tyrone Everett's supposed to be somewhere around here. You remember him? Oh, yeah, I remember that guy. He goes, I don't know if he has a stone. So we went into the office and you know, I said, I had the coordinates. He said, well, that would be right here. And so we went and looked and made sure. And yep, he, oh, he doesn't have a gravestone. So right then and there, I said, oh, wow, that's something I could do. I mean, I never, uh, my parents were still alive at that time. I had never bought a gravestone before, but I thought, I'm going to look into that. And so I talked to them and they said, well, you'd need to have approval from the family. So I said, okay. So I went away with the thought, I'm going to get a gravestone for him. And um, I found his family. I found his mother, but I called Tyrone Crawley, who was a great lightweight. Uh, yeah, I was going to bring up Yeah. And um, I was friendly with him and he, he passed away a few years ago. Um, and I said, uh, I told him the story and I said, I, I, I'm trying to find Mike. I mean, uh, uh, Tyrone Everett's family. And he said, I think they go to my church or so he knew there was some, something he knew he either knew them or knew someone at the church or something. So he said, give me, and he was also a policeman. So he had good access to, you know, uh, I guess <laughs> names and addresses. I don't know. But he, yeah. he, a couple of days later, he called me up and said, here, I got his mother's number. And so I called her up and I, told her who I was and said, you know, what I wanted to do. And she was shocked. Like, you know, Tyrone had been dead for a long time and she couldn't believe that someone cared. And so we made an appointment. I went and saw her like on a Saturday afternoon and I'm talking to her about it and she's crying and, you know, really into it. And then Mike ever comes in Mike ever, you know, at this point was, you know, probably in his fifties. It still looked like, you know, I could take you apart in a second i mean he was a couple guys like, whoa i remember mike ever but he was scary looking guy then you talk to him he's like this he's like a sweetheart but um and then eddie everett the brother the other brother came in and eddie everett looks just like tyrone and so it's just really crazy and so it just started there and i said well i want to get a i want to get a, a gravestone and um they were all into it and the mother said all i want is i want a picture of him on it you know he's a beautiful guy and everyone you know he was like the you know everyone loved loved him so I said, no problem. So, you know, that one I bought, I, I just put my own money into it and I got it and um, we put it down. And then from that point on, I said, you know, I realized there were a lot of fighters in unmarked graves. So I said, wow, this could be, I could do more of these. So maybe I'd turn it into a program. So, so I got a little publicity about the gravestone, Tyrone's gravestone. So it was on the, like the local news and some newspapers covered it. And then people you know, would send me small donations and things like that. And then I said, okay, that, that's it. I'm going to, there's a whole list. I, by that time I had a whole list of people. And so I just kind of called it a program and, and started to reach out and try to, you know, raise money to do it. And every few years I, I've done like six different fighters um, over, you know, so it's, it comes out that it's not as frequent. It was going like every few years now. It's been a lot of, uh, even one's yeah. amazing. What's yeah. that? Even one's amazing to do that for a fighter for another family just just because you're paying respect and you love watching them as a kid and that just one is amazing let alone six you know yeah but you know the thing is is that it's i appreciate that and i think it does register obviously with the families you know they've all been into it for the most part but what is really cool is in not in every case but in most of these cases I did not see what I did not see coming was that I would become really pretty close with the families and they, I would become like extended family to them because I had taken this step. That was definitely the case with the Everett's. I'm still close to Mike and Eddie um, Doris, their mother passed away years ago, but I was really close with her. You know, she was, uh, you know, such a nice woman and I would talk to them all the time, get together with them. The next one I did was um, Gypsy Joe Harris. And he was a real puzzle because I couldn't find where he was buried. And finally, I found um, his sister. And they told me where it was. And, you know, he, he had a bunch of sisters. And then he had a brother who lived down in Atlanta. And I became really close with him. I still talk to um, his older sister all the time. I just talked to her yesterday. And so this happened over and over. And, you know, um, I became close with the family in most cases. And that was a byproduct that I didn't see happening. Like I was doing it for um, to honor someone that I respected. Um, I personally got a lot out of it. You know, it's not every day you can do something nice for 
your hero who's you know yeah. been dead for 30 years you know like like it, 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 it i got a lot out of it i it felt good to do it and um but then there's this whole other side of it this personal thing that happened and that was amazing when i think about it that's what that's what i take away from it that's what it you know i, I never met timer ever but you know i'm I'm friends with his brother who looks just like him and his other brother who fought with him. And, you know, they had this rivalry between them. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's a way to get the dig the hole deeper and to get more involved. And <laughs> it really is it's an amazing thing, you know? So there was that, um, you mentioned the Giardella statue. Um, we were at the hall of fame one time and Joey Giardella used to always come to the hall of fame. And someone said, you know, in a little circle, they said we should do something for him and the thought was maybe we'd make some kind of plaque and go put it on there's a there's a restaurant in a bar down in south philly called stogie joe's cool place well that's what used to be the pass young tavern and then there was a pool hall above that and on the third floor there was the pass young gym and that's where joey he trained he played pool and he drank at the at the tavern that was his corner Sure. And um, they said, "Oh, we'll get we'll get a we'll get a, a plaque and put it there." And and I said, "A plaque? Let's do more than that. Why don't we do a stuff?" Because one of the people in our group was this artist, Carl Lavach, and he was the one that said, "Oh, we should do I could do a bronze plaque." And I said, "What about a statue?" And so we started this process, and um, you know, started to raise money and started to get support for it, and you know, went through the whole bit, found out where we could do it, and then went to a councilman, and um, you know, cut through, you know all the politics of that and then had to raise the money and then had most of the money, but then needed more money for like the site and had to do the, the city wanted us to do more than just throw a statue there. We had to plant trees and put in pavers and stuff like that. So we had another fundraising drive, you know, and, you know, we got there, it took us, you know, probably it took us, you know, four years or something, you know, something like that, but it's there and it's statues really cool. And, um, you know, it's a part of the neighborhood and it, it, it means something because that was his neighborhood. You know, he, he's from Brooklyn, but he came down to Philly and that was his area. And those people in that neighborhood loved him. And so it's the perfect place for this statue to be. So, you know, that was a really um, great project, you know, and, and it's again, it's an extension. It's same thing that goes on with the website. Um, it's keeping these memories alive and reminding people you know, people can walk down there, be going to a restaurant or a bar. There's all kinds of things down there to do. And they say, oh, who's this boxer? You know, they might not even know anything about boxing or very little. And then they can go they can read a little bio about him. There's also on the base, there's things like other fighters from South Philly. And there's like gyms and venues that are gone now listed. So it's a little history lesson. And um, just to say, I did that project, Philly Boxing History, along with the Harrogate Boxing Club, a gym. Um, up in um, you know the northeast near the VBA, and um, uh, the the Harrogate um, Philly boxing history, um, and we put that and the Veteran Boxer Association, we put that together and raised the money and put it up there. So and it was you know I say it's like one of the best kept secrets in Philly because you know. A lot of everybody knows the Rocky statue, which is, you know, the biggest thing around. It's bigger than Liberty Bell. But, um, you know, before the Joe Frazier statue, people used to be rioting in the streets saying, why isn't there a, a statue of a real fighter? And I'm like, 13th yeah. and the 13th of past year, if there is one. But, you know, like people don't seem to know much about it. But um, it's a really nice statue and it's a great setting. You know, it's it right cool. there on that triangle with all the streets, you know, going around. It's great. So. What's cool is too, even as a fan, like before before I ever even reached out to you or knew you, I knew your name and I knew the statue because I went and visited it. And um, when I went, I'm looking on the back and it's all the Italians that are from Philadelphia on the back. Mm -hmm. And it says, I'm, I'm pretty sure Cambria AC is listed on there. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I was thinking back being a nut like I am of in Rocky Six where he says, oh, yeah, I fought the Cambria AC was right down the street. The bucket of blood, they used to call it. Yeah, so it all connects. You know what I mean? Yeah, Cambria. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it, yeah, it's another. That's a venue that started like in like nineteen. I, I don't know all the facts off the top of my head. Once I write about them and put them <laughs> on the website, then I, I can release it. But it's something like nineteen seventeen, and it was they had boxing there every Friday night until the guy Johnny Burns, who who was the promoter, 
um, and I guess he owned the place, he died. And then it continued on into the 60s, but it wasn't as it wasn't every Friday night like it was for the first, you know, many years. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was this legendary place. And the, the building's still there. In fact, um, Buddy Osborne of the um, uh, Rock Ministries and Rock Ministries Boxing Gym um, bought the building recently and they're they're renovating it into like expanded wow. space for for it was it was like a garage for for many wow. years and um then i guess it was vacant and so he got it a year or two ago and as far as i know they're they're converting it he can his his place is on the other side but it can connect like it's on the other side of the block but he's, he has a big space for a gym and then he also does ministry there and they also do amateur shows and things but so he's going to have this uh this this um extra space and so for the first time i went into this after reading about it and seeing pictures i went into it like a year or so ago um with him looked around like oh my god the balcony's still there and you know it's I'd be you, awesome. you can picture it like i've only seen a handful of pictures from there and a couple of little films but you know it's it that's it it's there it's really cool so yeah everything is it's almost like uh with the grave program with the statues it's almost as if you're completing the story it comes to and it, some of these guys are gypsy joe harris like when you as you were talking i was thinking about i read a, uh, an issue where they tried a sports illustrated writer tried to get him to do the program where he got placed on the cover mm. for his title fight and yeah. they couldn't they couldn't find him they said they were going through every pool hall they're going through really different bars to try to find him. It was almost like, to, like this guy is going to fight for the title in a couple months. Where is he? Why isn't he training? It's yeah, like that's a good question. Yeah, or Eddie. There are a lot of questions like that about him. You know, he was a great yeah. natural talent, and I don't think he liked to train very much. Yeah, he was a party. You know, he was a partying guy. And uh, you know, I talked to his family. and said the guy loved candy bars, so he'd always yeah. have candy bars in his pocket. You know, he was he's got to fight. You know, but um, he was, uh, each guy, each fighter is a miniature movie. Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. And that's the thing, like, like you know, the average boxing fan doesn't ever hear about a guy like that. It's not like he's the only one out there. I'm sure every city's got one. Eddie Cole. Like him. But the thing is, is that that's the stuff, like, like you here's, you see this, you take Bernard Hopkins' career. He's he's arguably the most accomplished fighter ever to come out of Philly. <laughs> Certainly made the most money, probably, and, um, you know, had more, you know, big fights and everything. And he's great. He's great. But and it's a great story, you know, but th some of these little guys who they had the dream, you know, and and yeah. they, they Gy Gypsy Joe Harris, he was a natural fighter. He had a lot of skill, he had a really unusual style and he was really good. Um, but, you know, he had this secret and that was he couldn't see out of his one eye and whether he never could see he, he was injured as a child. So his eyesight got worse and worse as things went on, as time went on. So I don't know. He probably started his career. He could probably see better than by the end of his career. But the point is, he was he won, you know, um, all his fights up to and he fought Emil Griffith. He lost a decision to him, uh, but he took that in stride. I mean, Emil Griffith was a former champion and, you know, he expected this to go on. And his dream was always to be a, a, a world champion and um, knew he was going to do it. And then before his next fight, they discovered that he was blind in the eye and um, they pulled his license and he was never able to fight again. So there he was, he lost his dream. He had nothing. That was what he put his, all his time into and it all ended. And he was 22 years old. You know, I was, you know, I was, I was uh, in college or just graduating college, you know, I don't know which, 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 what direction I was going in and he knew where he was going, but then it was all taken from him. And again, you can't make any, you can't have a blind fighter fighting. It was for his safety. But, um, yeah, it's an amazing story because – and it's a tragic story because what happened was he kind of fell off the deep end after that. He became a, a drug addict, and, you know, he struggled for a number of years. He, he, he was 22 years. He had the dream, and he lived another 22 years, you know, trying to, yeah. you know – pick up the pieces he died at 44 and um he didn't die of a drug overdose he had actually gotten clean but there was so much his body had taken so much uh punishment that he had like a series of heart attacks and eventually he died but um you know when people talk about gypsy joe harris people that saw him they light up they say like this guy he was real he was a, he was an entertainer like 
you know, he was a good fighter, but he was also like a clown and he was, you know, really, um, oh. um, like, you know, like he was just, you know, out there as far as like his, his outfit. He would, they say that he was the first fighter to wear tassels on his shoes that Ali picked that up from him, you know? Wow. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the legend. And, you know, he's got such a great story and, yeah, he's he's you know if you dig you, you know people dig into it they'll find that story but it's not a it's not a um he's not a common name and for a long time he was the first non heavyweight non champion to be on Sports Illustrated so his story was so unique and so interesting that you know it got him on you know the biggest sporting magazine and you know at a time when you know that wasn't the case you know lighter weight classes you know certainly the champion like Sugar Ray Robinson was on there, I'm sure, a bunch of times, but Gypsy Joe Harris, you know, like a, a more or less a local guy who who did beat Curtis Cokes, who was welterweight champion at the time. He beat him at Madison Square Garden in a non-title fight. And um, you know, but the title wasn't on the line, but he beat him. And um, but he never he never fought for the title. There was one time when the they had a fight scheduled for the title and the fight fell apart, include and part of it was that Gypsy Joe was not in shape. He didn't make weight. and But there was other problems with the promotion. It all kind of collapsed. But, yeah, he, he never got there. And it wasn't long after that that they discovered his his issue. And that was the end. That's tough. Like, it's... What a story. You know, what a story with this guy. And it's like you could go – we could go on and on about some of the stories of these guys of where they could literally be movies made. I bring up Dorazio or Eddie Cool or any of these guys, mm -hmm. obscure Philly fighters, but were also to us like heroes and legends, and they could be made into feature films, and they would be, you know, they would be awesome to watch. Like I think yeah. about, um, I think about even even Ty, like Ty Crawley, like when you yeah. brought his mm -hmm. story is crazy. Like he, my uncle's a good, really good friends with their best. Oh friend. right, that's right. I remember you saying that. Yeah, we're police officers together in the police athletic league of Philadelphia. And his story started off where he would box as a kid. I'm sure you know it already, but he would box as a kid and um, wanted to become like a professional boxer, but he was super disciplined. Um, so he went to the uh, become a paratrooper. And the reason he became a paratrooper was initially he went to the army. And they said, the only way that you can box is if you become a paratrooper and you have to jump out of planes. So he said, all right, no problem. And then he comes home and he's, he's boxing in the army. He's the army champion. Then he comes home and he's he's taking classes at Temple. He starts his boxing career, always with the motivation to become a cop because his dad was his father was a police officer. Um, but through it all, just crazy discipline. He I went over to his house the one day and he had some old, he'd pull out boxes of some of his old stuff and he would show me his training program. And he's like, You want to be a fighter? You want to do this and that? He's like, here's what I did on on 12 25, mm. 79. It's like three miles, weights, this, that, everything that he ate. Yeah, uh, that's and, cool. And then to go, you know, what he did, I think he was 21 and one with his last fight with Bramble. Yeah. Uh, but he had one more after Bramble, but uh, getting a shot at the title. Supposedly, Mancini paid him step aside money because he was, he uh, was yeah. mm. in that echelon with those top guys. But then yeah. afterwards, um, retiring from boxing and just doing a lot for Philadelphia, like for the community. And it's like with his like wisdom of everything he did, like he almost took all the positives out of boxing and, and helped others with it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He was, a, he was amazing. He was a really nice guy, super yeah. guy and um, fun to talk to always into boxing. You know, if a big fight was coming up, you know, he'd say, he'd say Oh, who you got, who, you, you know, he'd want to talk about it. He'd, say, oh, no, no. he'd always have opinions about how a big fight was going to go. He also was really into football, which I'm not really, but like I'm casual, but, yeah. Um, he was really into football and, you know, all the sports and everything. He, yeah, he was a great, a really nice guy and um, a good boxing friend because he was, uh, he knew his stuff. And, you know, long after his career, he was training fighters and he was doing things, especially his son, but he was doing uh, things in boxing still, but he still loved it. And he, he wasn't, like some fighters really kind of, um, you know, and it doesn't end so great. They get, you know, kind of fed up with it or they get, you know, bitter, angry about it. He never was like that. He's a really positive guy, and a um, he was an amazing guy. He was really cool. Yeah, super inspirational. It's like you have two. It's almost the way I look at it too. Is just playing, even playing sports as a kid. It's it's almost like you put stock into that being your identity. I don't know if you've experienced mm -hmm. this too. 
where it's almost like when you lose that, you go through a crisis a little bit. Sure. Or, you know, I think with Ty, he always knew like his principles as a man and that kind of like his discipline and his structure. And I think that was like his identity. And I think he was a man of faith too. So I think that was his core. So all, boxing was almost like what he did. Whereas yeah. his identity, you know what I mean? It wasn't his identity. Absolutely. And, you know, to that point, um, not to continue to talk about me, but I, I feel that right now in my life, like I'm 61 years old now, and I'm really happy about all the stuff I've done with my website and the different projects and stuff like that. And I'm proud of it. And I want to continue it, but I'm 61. So, you know, maybe I got another good 20 years left. And like I did these two books, I want to do more projects like that. And so I've started to like, I don't go to every fight anymore. I used to go to every single local fight and follow the local fighters. If they had a big fight in New York or Las Vegas or places like that, I would go to all those and put that time in. And if I go to a fight, I always feel a certain obligation to write about it before, because when I was growing up, even more than reading about the fights, I like the stuff from the gym and the lead up of the fight and the hype of it and the, you know, getting to know the fighters. So I feel like if I'm going to go to a fight, I want to spend time on a pre-story, maybe go to the gym and talk to, you know, one or two of the fighters, then go to the fight, spend the night there, you know, take my notes, go home, write it, then put it together with the photos and post it. And, um, I'm really happy and proud of what I've done for 20 years, but it's real. I really started to burn out doing that. And um, so I, I, I want to use my time to the best, um, the, the, the best that I can. And I think that what's calling me is other types of projects. So like, like you've stepped in and written and covered some fights for me and I I'm always looking for people to do that, do that yeah. because I'm not at every fight anymore. So I'll either pick up, other people's you know writing and, and use it and that, that i've always pictured my website to be um like a gathering of, of information not just my writing um but other people's and you know i'd like more of that i'd like people if they're going to fights to send me their stories and you know i still have good um connections you know daryl cobb goes to most of the fights and photographs but there's other guys on the scene too um that i can get photos from and and post it but i feel that sort of it's not a crisis that, you know, I've lost my identity, but what it is, is it's a change. Like it's a change in my life. Like I've done it on my professional side, you know, like I got out of college and I had these types of jobs. I started with like accounting and finance jobs. And I got a little worn out of that. And then I moved into marketing and did things like that. And, but I was always interested in other things, you know, creative projects and stuff. I never earned a living doing it, but I always was a writer and I was always, I made films and I did a lot of things like that. But um, so now, like for so many years, 20 years, this has been the thing that's driven me more than anything. And I still love it. And I still feel a responsibility to keep doing it. But I don't have the same drive to go every Friday night to a fight somewhere or Saturday night. Um, I keep tabs on it. I still care about a lot of the fighters. And I'm really interested in it. And I watch everything that's on TV. And um, I watch a lot of the streaming uh, broadcasts of the local fights. But um, I'm very selective now when I go. Um, and it's really just a, it's, a, it's the time commitment that is starting to change for me. I don't know, man, we're getting old. I don't know what it is, but I, it's changing. And, like, and so that's a very uncomfortable thing because even the Briscoe Awards, I love the Briscoe Awards. I love what it stands for. But I, and I, I also do the Hall of Fame, I'm really tired of planning an event. I don't care about, I don't want to put time into the menu. Yeah. I want to put time into, you know, the awards or, or like, you know, like I spend so, those things are, they're great, but it's one day. It's like months of planning, wearing, burning out like crazy. And then yeah, one day, which, you know, is really cool, but everyone enjoys it but me because i'm just running around like crazy but um it's to the point now that i'm trying to reimagine the briscoe awards i don't want to plan a plan an event every year and do what i've done in the past i'd like to i just don't feel that i can do it the same way anymore and if i'm not driven to do it 
it's not going to be as good. It's not going to be as, you know, like, like I, I, you know, and I don't have the budget to say, I'm going to hire this person to do it all. It's not, you know, this is still a pretty small time operation, even though the Briscoe Awards is, is pays for itself. Now, first it came out of my pocket, but now it pays for itself and, and makes a little bit of money every year. And so I can I have money to start with instead of fronting the money to make the statues and things. I usually have enough to get that started, but so I'm trying to find ways of doing it a different way, like maybe a virtual Briscoe Awards, certainly naming all the winners and keeping that history going and giving them awards, whether that means going to the gym and handing them a, a trophy and filming it or photographing it and then presenting it somehow online. I'm, I haven't figured it out. And um, I had a number of suggestions and I'm still kind of playing with it. So I'm sort of in, in between. Like I'm not going to, last year we did, um, the Briscoe Awards and the Hall of Fame together. That was a really good experiment, and I liked it. The problem is, is that the Briscoe Awards originally was a free event. Then it was it grew into like a cheap event. Like I charge five bucks, I charge ten bucks. Um, but the Hall of Fame's always been more of a banquet. It's more expensive. It's more, and so when we combined it, we had a combined ticket of like it was over a hundred dollars. I think it was one hundred twenty five dollars. There was also a like a no eating and drinking ticket for like 65 bucks. But that wasn't my audience. My audience is used to it just being a party for the community. And that's really what I wanted it to always be. And, you know, I could pay for it with sponsorships and ads and I had loyal sponsors, but that's the thing. Like I haven't figured it out. And sometimes I think it does make sense to combine it because then you've got the old and the new together in one thing. But it doesn't suit everyone. And when we did combine it, the Hall of Fame crowd was there because they're used to paying 75 or 100 bucks for a ticket. Um, but the Briscoe Award crowd was not as big because suddenly it was sticker shock. You know, it was 10 bucks. Then we didn't do it a couple of years because of COVID. And then, boom, came back and had a big ticket price. That was never my intention. And it was just an experiment. So that might happen in the future again. But I just have to figure out a way to make it work for both audiences. So, yeah, so I, I like you, you talk about that um, sort of, um, uh, you know, like it's, I wouldn't call it a crisis, but it's definitely a transition period. And it's something that I, you know, I think a lot about and I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not settled on what direction to go. So I'm working through that. So it's, yeah, it's growing pains, but it's, you know, that, that's I'm, because uh, you know i take it seriously i take it you know it's important to me and so i can't just blow it off and say ah, okay enough that's enough of that i don't feel that way i want to keep it going but yeah. i want to do it in a different way do it just smarter from, just from the outside well one thing is when we the briscoe awards where you did it after covid it's probably stressful to plan all that but i thought that was awesome how you had it three events i think it was 21 22 and 23 all in one I mm-hmm. thought that was uh, awesome. But one thing I wanted to say for sure is um, like, f- if you think about all these fighters that you've covered on the website, the grave program and their extended families, the, the fans like me, thousands and thousands of people that almost as if you're their hero in a way, mm-hmm. really I think seriously, because you're looking up to these guys and like, same as me. And we're all, we all look up to these fighters because of what they do and they're warriors and they put it on the line. And that's something that we admire. It's almost like intrinsic in us, but like you're giving light and you're putting the stories out to these guys that it's, there's no price on that. There's no, there's no, it's almost as if you're the hero for them in a way. And, and I, don't well, think, I don't think you take the credit that you deserve seriously. Cause even well, from- I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I do, I really believe that what I am as a fan, I'm going to wait a little bit of that. You know, I, well, I, I appreciate hearing that. And, I, I, you know, I've heard that from people, not that I'm the hero. I haven't heard that too many times, but, but I've heard people say, you know, how they, they appreciate what I'm doing. And I, and I, I really do appreciate that. And um, I, it, it means a lot to me. And, but it is like, like, you know, I have a lot of friends now that are fighters or ex fighters. And when I'm watching these fighters, you know, there's nothing better than watching that career kind of climb. And then it gets to the point where they sort of top out. And now it's starting to be dangerous for them to keep fighting. But there's that drive to keep going and they drive themselves. And 
you know, I might write something and say, oh, this guy is like, you know, because I try to be really honest. I never take cheap shots at anyone, but I've had fighters be mad at me for different things I've written. Oh, this guy wasn't in shape or like, I always felt that if you write, if you want to write that someone did a great job in a fight, for it to really mean anything, you have to be honest enough if they blow a fight to kind of, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a nice but honest way, say, yeah, you know, this happened. You know, he wasn't ready or wasn't in shape or something, whatever it was. And sometimes fighters don't like that, like, because they want to just be, you know, supported and stroked. And I understand that, but that's not my job. But the thing is, is that I watch these old fighters and I say, they got to pull, they got to get out before something happens. And so I'm not taking any punches, but I feel the same way. I feel if, if I, my passion isn't a hundred percent, I have to start looking for other ways. And maybe that is putting my, my faith in other people to run things like someone else to manage this or do that. Um, because I want to do, I know that every Briscoe award, some of them are, you know, there's always problems. There's always, you know, things that didn't go, you know, well, but for the most part, like I feel really happy about all of them because I know I gave a hundred percent and got everything I could out of it and um, gave as much as I could to the community. And it was amazing to watch, you know, boxing is a lot of like rivalries, not just in the ring, but you got promoters that can't stand each other. And the Briscoe Wars would be sitting there having a beer together. It's like, wow, see that, see that over there. Like you don't see that every day. And that's the kind of thing it was. And, um, but like I said, my, my, my priorities feel like they're shifting and I don't want to be that sort of slow footed fighter. Who's like, you know, not, not bringing it anymore. And, um, so I'm, I'm trying to find a different way to do it, keep it going, but find a, another way to do it. So I appreciate everything you say. And I think there's, you know, I think there's truth to the fact that I've, I've worked hard and I've given a lot. Um, but don't think that I didn't get anything from it. I didn't get one penny. There's no money. But the thing is, is that it's just for me to, to um, like something and to be interested in something, it's not enough for me to just read about it or watch it. I want to find a way to kind of push it and get involved in some way, you know, to a fault a lot of times. You know, I put time in. And it's like, you know, it, it, you know, I'm always like, oh, is it worth it? What is worth it for a number of reasons? But there's also there's also a paradigm with the Briscoe Awards that always has bothered me. Once it got going, we put I put this out there. And especially early on, the people who would win the awards, they would be super happy about it and really into it. And for after a period of time, people really wanted to win the award. And I'd hear like, how come I didn't win an award? And that's a good thing because it means people want it. But one thing that happens, it's not every, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to mention any names, but um, it happens a lot. And that is you have a, say a fighter, you know, fighter X who comes to the Briscoe Wars, maybe they're the rookie of the year and they're into it. And, you know, maybe a couple of years later, they win another award. They're in the fight of the year. Well, Certain fighters, when they reach a certain point and they get to the top, suddenly they don't want to come to the Briscoe Awards. Yeah. Now, I understand that life gets complicated for those guys because everywhere they go, you know, people are pulling at them and and everything is money. And it's like, well, if I'm going to make an appearance like, you know, I don't nobody gets paid with the Briscoe Awards. They get an expensive trophy. But again, when you hit a certain um, a certain uh, level. You know, it's it's they it almost it feels like they've gotten too big for it, and I really push back at that. And I've had conversations with some of these guys because the thing is, is that what they're doing is they're training the next generation of fighter. That hey, it's cool to be here when you're, you know, on the way up. But you know how how good it would be for the Briscoe Awards for one of these top guys to make sure they were there the optics of that is really important instead i can't tell you how many times i have to give the fighter of the year to nobody not to get the award and like hey i'm a good sport i drive over and give it to him at the gym i should throw it at him half the time but the <laughs> thing is is that that's not it i don't want to give it to someone else yeah. they're the fighter of the year 
they reached the peak, but they didn't, they didn't, um, you know, continue on. So many guys were there for so many years. And then when they could really help and bring it to their fans, I've read stories about fighters saying, uh, oh, Philly, they don't appreciate me. And I think, hey, what are you talking about? You blew off the Briscoe Awards last year and all your fans were pissed yeah. that you weren't there. Everyone wanted to see you, but you were too big for that. Now, don't get me wrong. I love these guys. I support them. This is their time to make money. I wanted to do it, but that's a very hard thing to swallow it's because hard. it's just, it's yeah. not cool. Yeah. You know, it's not, it doesn't take much. I have one guy say, I can't come. I'm going somewhere. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. That weekend. Well, there's a bunch of them. But the thing is, I say, well, the Briscoe was on Sunday. Go on Monday. And yeah. we're not talking about, oh, they're making this plan today. I get over. to them four months ahead of time and say, hey, we're going to do this thing. What date's good for you? I'm thinking this date. So that's it. So, again, I don't hold any grudges. It's just that, like, I throw a $40,000 party at the casino and – certain people aren't there it's like you know it's not cool it's not and it, it it helps to drain the the fun out of it now i'll tell you one guy who never disappointed and that's steve cunningham yeah, steve cunningham didn't have the career of some of these other guys meaning he didn't make as much money as some of these guys but he had a great career and he would go to europe for a title defense and he was he was fighting that weekend and i'd say to him when when should we have the uh the briscoe awards when should we have the briscoe awards um you know this weekend or this week you know and he'd say no no i'll be back my fight's on saturday i'll be back on uh monday i'll be there now most fighters wouldn't be there but he would always be there he was a, he's a, got a lot of character he took it seriously and um he was a great um he was a great representative you know he had a great career and he took the Briscoe Award seriously. And there's a lot of other people who did too. There's only a handful. And again, it's just, there's a time when like, when you're giving back, they, they have a lot of people pulling at them, but that's something that I feel they should take seriously. For sure. And, and when they don't, it's like, well, you know, maybe it's, I never think it's not worth doing it, but I think, come on. You know, I think more of you than that. And it's like, if they said, I can't do it, if months ahead of time, they, I'd work out the date with them. It's their day. Yeah. But, you know, so that's that's another thing that, that plays into it. You know, it's like, you know, it's like you feel like you're banging your head against the wall. And it's like, I've got to twist arms to, you know. So that's something that's like kind of part of the story. But it's it's a, it's a, it's part of the story. I, I don't, I don't, I, I, it's, it'll be an interesting thing to uh, write about one day. This is it's, yeah, it's, so. it's it's act, but this is all active history. Like this is even your yeah. story. you being a hero to all the fighters, doing all this for them. When who else is who else is really doing it? We have a couple of guys that are really good guys that are uh, like Chuck and um, like Peltz. But outside Absolutely. of a couple couple icons, it's like who's really going to be doing that? Who cares enough to say here's an award for being a you know the uh, the the rookie of the year or to do the website or to do the great program. It's almost like you're feeling burnt out, but at the same time, it's everybody knows John DeSanto. If you're a boxing fan, you know who, you know, they all know you. And the old, the common thing I always hear is, oh yeah, he never, John never gives himself enough credit for everything he does. Never gives himself enough credit. And that's, it's the truth. It's like, uh, well, I appreciate it, but I, yeah, it's not about me. It's about the subjects. It's about the sports. It's about those guys. Yeah. And the only thing I ever asked was for them to um, engage and be part of it. And 80% of them have been. Most of them have been. They all have been at one point. It's just when I could really use them, they're not there. And that's, again, I'm talking about a handful of guys who I love. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But it'll be – the thing is, is that for those guys, again, when you're at the top, you got a lot coming at you. You're, 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 you get a lot of um, – recognition and a lot of acknowledgement and uh, validation some of these other guys who maybe don't make it to the top i know that they'll look back and they'll say that day that they got the briscoe award and everyone was there you know hundreds of people were there cheering them on 
And that means something because, you know, one day there'll be an old man like me and they'll say, oh, I remember that. And they'll look on their trophy case. Oh, here's their Briscoe Award. And yeah. that means something. And I would hope that that would be the case for all these guys because it is something that their hometown has, you know, done for them. And I think that's that's it's not everything, especially when you're chasing the the big fights and the big money. It doesn't um, it doesn't uh, mean as much, but it will. I think it will definitely will. in time. And so, you know, but it's it's like yeah. the hometown, the hometown recognition, you know. And if there was a Briscoe Award back in the day, we would have winners from if you were around back then, we'd have Benny Briscoe, a ten time Briscoe Award right. winner. <laughs> you know what I that's mean? what I, that's what I think about too. Is like if something like this was around back then, how cool it would be. And that's why I want to keep it going because it's that history, that storyline that's important. That you know, there'll be like yeah, like like you know, Steve Cunningham's won several. The uh, Tevin Farmer's won a bunch. You know, there's guys who are multiple winners and. When you look at that list, it's pretty. It's pretty wild. It's pretty cool. So. One day you got Atlantic City down, and then Canastota down. Yeah, right. I, I actually, I'm actually New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame. I'm not in Atlantic City. Okay, New Jersey. Um, I'm in New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame, and um, uh, I think Canastota is a bit of a reach, but uh, you know. Think about it though. Number one, Rock, Rocky Balboa's hometown. Number one mm -hmm. city for boxing. Who's yeah. the one name that's covered every Philadelphia fighter done the most for the city in terms of boxing history? Is it's a no brainer? I think I think it's a no brainer. Seriously. Well, it's nice to hear. It's nice to hear. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's a stretch. But uh, like I said, I'm I'm good with New Jersey. I would think that one day I might make it to the Pennsylvania Boxing Hall of Fame. Oh. It won't happen while I'm the chairman. Like I've been nominated. I said, now my name won't go on the ballot until that. You know, I'm not gonna the the the, the impression would be, oh look, he put himself in the hall of fame, yeah, no, and that's no, not the no, case. No one would but, think uh, so. That. Well, now, but it, so the time will come. I'm an old man now, but when I'm older, man, then I'll crawl up there and and do it if I get in. But uh, and yeah, that that's cool. That this is where I have um put all my effort, and that's in Philadelphia, and um and by extension the rest of Pennsylvania being involved with the hall of fame, and you know I believe in it, so. Yeah, it's 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 a you know it's a nice thing, and I think the Hall of Fame's a a great organization and a great tradition. You know, it, it means something when these guys. It's like almost the last honor. You know, they've had their career and stuff, and then you know you can see for most people it means a lot. It means a lot for them to get the call and to go up there and you know be recognized. That that's important, and that feels good to be part of that. You for know? sure. So, what do you think's next? We got published author. Philly, Philly mm -hmm. boxing history, all the things, all the different programs. What do you think is kind of weighing on you to do next? Maybe a large format book, like independent, like an independent yeah. book. Yeah, I'd like to do. I'd like to do more boxing books. Um, I don't just want to write about boxing in book form, but I do have. I think I have at least a couple more in me, and um, you know, I, I think I want to do more like that. I think it's it's the kind of thing like it's a good challenge, you know, like some of the other stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've worked it hard and then doing a book and even a book like this, it was an undertaking and it was, um, you know, something that, uh, I really liked the process and I liked the idea of it. I've wanted to do books for a long time. So now I want to, there's a couple more things like that I want to do. And I want to find a way to keep the stuff I'm doing going without having, you know, finding a way to do it without, you know, finding the time to do it. Cause I'm, um, you know, like I said, I've got other things going and, um, it's really important to me. So I don't like doing like a, um, you know, a, 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 a partial job on it. I want to go all the way, but you know, if I do that, I won't do the books. And if I, and that's the thing, it's like, you know, it's pretty consuming to kind of do it. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of shifting and I have some other projects like that I want to do. So, it but it's, it's right. a lot of them will have the same, the same emphasis, you know? Yeah. Maybe combine, Maybe do a little screen as you have the writing down, the movies, boxing, maybe do a screenwriting and come up with a like produce your own movie. Maybe that could be Yeah, I mean, I have a long history of like loving movies and I've always I used to make movies and I'm just, you know, never, never uh professionally or anything like that. And um yeah, it's something that I really like and I you know, I have thoughts about that. But again, I also know with I think I think writing a book is very manageable it's my own time and my own focus and my own ability and when you talk about doing films there's so many other things that come into play 
including the finances of it. And like I've made films in the past and I've got myself in tremendous debt making a film and then had to dig my way out of it. I didn't dig it out by selling the movie and, you know, paying for itself, identify, you know, going back to work and doing something. So, you know, I, I love movies and I've always played around making them and I always will. But I think my goal is to just do more books. And, you know, if that, if that were to blossom into something else, then great. But I think I want to keep my focus on something that I can really do well. And, you know, at this point you start thinking about, you know, you got so much time and how much, um, you know, how many stories can you tell and what can you tell? So, yeah. I want to, I want to kind of start checking off some of these things that I have, you know, it's been on since, my list. So and since 1976, where we had a creative individual fictional story of a Philly fighter and yeah. who better knows all the Philly fighters than you. Well, I'll tell you that, that Philly fighter, Rocky Balboa and Sylvester Stallone, I say, um, is responsible for more boxing fans than probably <laughs> anyone other than maybe Muhammad Ali, but I at least gives Ali a run for his money because the truth is, is that um, I was already a boxing fan, but in 1976 when Rocky came out, boy, that really was a, a boost. And it was the same year as the 76 Olympic team, which was Ray Leonard and the Sphinx brothers and Howard Davis. And that was an Olympics on this East coast time zone. It was in Montreal. So we watched it all on TV. Those two things, you know, set the stage for that great 1980s, you know, the late 70s and 80s. Um, and it was nothing like it. And, you know, a lot of people have give grief to the Rocky statue for some reason, like, oh, it's not even a real fighter. You got to be kidding me. It's the biggest gift that we've ever <laughs> been given. And like yeah. I said, it's bigger than the Liberty Bell. You drive by at midnight, someone's out there taking a picture with, with yeah. Rocky. And um, I'm a big Rocky fan. I, I like movies and there's a lot of great boxing movies, but I think Rocky's the greatest boxing movie. It's not my favorite, but it's way up there. It's, you know, a top three or top five boxing movie, you know, for sure. But it's no, no other boxing movies had that kind of impact. Yeah, for sure. So we'll end, yeah. with, this. We'll end with a couple questions, two more questions for you, if that's mm -hmm. all right. No, yeah. Give me your top five, not in any order. Not, you're not going to disclude people you're in any order. Um, most influential Philadelphia fighters that kind of inspired you to do all this. So probably Benny's one. Maybe. Benny's one, Saad Muhammad, Matthew Saad Muhammad, Jeff Chandler. Um, definitely those three guys. Um, they were the ones that I grew up, um, you know, idolizing. Um, others, you know, like if I look at the history, you know, I really like Bob Montgomery a lot. Um, I, you know, and, you know, Joe Frazier has got to be in the list, but, you know, it's hard, it's hard when you come up to the last name, cause I can think of 10 more. So, you know, but those first three, they're, they're the guys for me. Did you know, uh, off topic, but supposedly, uh, Bob Montgomery is Tammy Terrell's uncle. I heard something like no, that. No, it's not, it's not Bob Montgomery. It's, um, well, there's Ernie Terrell. Wait. Oh no no you're right yeah, I think I, I'm not sure I, I'm trying you know I, Ernie Terrell but there was there was somebody else is it Bob Montgomery yeah I, to be honest I don't know but I've heard oh hang on am I still there yet I think my battery's starting to die yeah yeah it's all, it's all good well let's do this John um how can people find you like I we got JohnDesano.com any social medias how how can they buy your book. Buy the book at johndesanto.com. You can get either either book, um, um, 20 bucks plus shipping, and then a combo deal for both of them. Um, and then uh, Philly Boxing History. Uh, you can send me an email on that. And, um, you know, my number's all over it. But, yeah, at the moment, I'm, I'm selling the book. So, yeah, johndesanto.com is the best way. And then there's Philly Boxing History on Facebook and then John DeSanto on Facebook and, you know, some other things. But they're the main ones for sure. I definitely recommend the book. It was I read it Thank a couple times now. It's awesome. It's a boxing fan's delight, all levels. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Seriously, I really appreciate you doing this, John. It means a lot to me. No problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I, I support you, and good luck with the podcast. And like I said, if you ever want to go and uh, uh, write about fights and cover oh, fights, yeah. I'm always I'm always uh, looking for somebody to do it. I'm always I'm always down. If I'm free, I'm always down. Now I got I got a little bit more free time now. Now that I'm not grading papers all the time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I know. You went over on to something else. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah very good. It. It's been awesome there. Yeah. Yeah, cool. good, good. 
Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you.